Thanks for staying with us. Now, the definition of democracy is a form of government in which the common people hold political power and can rule either directly or through elected representatives. An example of democracy at work is in the United States, where people have political freedom and equality. May 29 was initially the official Democracy Day in Nigeria, marking when the newly elected Olusha Obasanjo took office as the president of Nigeria in 1999. And in multiple decades of military rules and that began in 1966 and, inter and had been interrupted only by a brief period of democracy from 1979 to 1983. For 27 years, we have been practicing democracy in Nigeria. However, are we truly a democratic nation? Olu uh, Olarewaju Suraju is a public commentator, a campaigner, and analyst at national and international levels. He is an active participant in Nigeria's fight against military regimes in the 90s and was detained by the military regime of the late General Sani Abacha. As a renowned human rights and social activist with interest in accountability, food security, leadership, human development, anti-corruption and good governance, Mr. Suraju has worked and collaborated with many progressive funds. He is currently the chairman of the Human and Environmental Development Agenda a Nigerian-based NGO and civil society network against corruption. Now, remember, you can join this conversation, tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Waysho Africa one with the hashtag Waze, or you send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-8038-4663. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Larry Kay. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. Thank you for having me. All right, so because we really lost some time, <laughs> we'll go straight into the conversation. Um, what, what is your overall um, view of how the day has gone? Because today, um, history was um, made today. Officially, we celebrated Democracy Day after our president declared it last year, on the 6th of June, he declared um, 12th of June um, Democracy Day. So what's your take generally about um, democracy in Nigeria and how far we've come? Um, the, I, I think so. There are two questions that you have asked. I, I think, in terms of looking at democracy in Nigeria, uh, we can still agree that this is still a reflecting democracy. Um, what we have for it can actually be living nicely to um, civilian rule. Uh, the tenets of democracy that are expected to be the primary purpose of government are still missing uh, in large quantities in Nigeria. So look at the electoral period, look at the political party, look at the independence of the hands of government, look at public participation, uh, look at accountability. Uh, you would know and agree with me that it is nothing close to uh, the same climb where you would say democracy as family uh, taking root in those places. It's completely different for India. But the, the most important thing is we can let the state leave civilian rule for any other form of government. Uh, we, we, we hope to learn from the mistakes and improve on them, on them and pray that we would rather uh, improve uh, rather, uh, rather than lose you know, um, some of the gains uh, I've seen in the, in the recent period. For me, it is one of the victories that we can significantly attribute to this civilian rule. So it is not just about doing well. It is the victory for uh, the school who actually came out and marked and marked you uh, June 12th election uh, was the primary beginning of the collapse of the military who eventually in 1999. So what we had in 1999 is the handing over from the civilian regime uh, to um, well, from the military to the civilian regime of Obama and so was just the icing on the cake, the real fight for democracy and the disengagement of uh, the military regime started from June 12th. Uh, and that is why there are so many casualties, um, including um, the winner of the mandate of the June 12th election, as you like so, that several other people uh, that lost their lives, uh, prominent and also ordinary citizens, uh, lost their lives. Uh, and it is actually a major victory for those who have demanded that the day should be recognized. So the next step for us is not only just the recognition of the, of the day uh, and also the public holidays which uh, um, declared. The most significant 
point of the June 12 is the programs that actually galvanize the interest of Nigerians uh, to actually go to the polls. Not so just those people who voted for Abiola or for El It is more significantly um, what prompted people to want uh, a demand for the disengagement of the military. So this government and subsequent government must clearly imbibe the principles, that, the policies, the programs and manifesto of Abiola for Joshua. Uh, and that would be very important in terms of alleviating poverty, in terms of the education infrastructure, uh, the health system, and also good governance within uh, right. the Nigerian sector. All right, thank you so much, Larry. So quickly, we want to bring in Cheta Wanze. He is the lead partner as, uh, at SBM Intelligence, a geopolitical geopolit research firm based in Lagos, and he has joined this conversation. Cheta, good evening, if you can hear me. Um, thank you so much for joining good us. Good evening, I hear you. Thank you so much for joining us, Cheta. So you are, I mean, every time I listen to you, <laughs> all the time, you are so very, very strong on so many things, you know, and you're very, very opinionated, and I love that opinion. So I want to hear what you, you have to say about our democracy. And are we practicing true democracy in Nigeria? The short answer is no. Nigeria is not a democracy. Nigeria is a merely civilian rule. What is democracy? Democracy is a government for the people, by the people, and of the people, which is basically a situation where the people actually get to choose our leaders or their leaders and we prevent a tyranny by the majority. Unfortunately, we have backslid on all those fronts. The current Nigerian arrangement is not a government of the people. Um, you, we see it all the time where Nigeria's political elites do things that are clearly anti-people and basically nothing happens. They, they feel free to do what they like, when they like, how they like. Um, you have, uh, you also have the situation where it's not for the people. So give us an example. We're in the middle of a pandemic right now. Um, the not just Nigeria, but the whole world is suffering at this point in time. And what do we have? We have a situation where the governments or agents of the government are carrying on as if it's business as usual. Um, good example: the newly revised budgets. Uh, there is no reason why, as an example, a lot of the recurrent expenditure or capital projects which are, which are government focused should not have been put on hold so that the key things which are needed for us as a people to, um, to move forward and to get over this pandemic are focused on. But what do we have? We have a situation where um, health and education were reduced by factors of more than with more than 30, approaching 40%, one of them 54%, while the budget for the National Assembly was reduced by, um, a, by a, uh, about 10%. Uh, that clearly is not a government for the people. It's a government for the elites. So the word for what Nigeria is running at the moment is called anocracy, a government for those at the top. And when we realize that, and we realize that the reason is because since the, um, since the Aboyade Commission sat in the, in the early 70s, Nigeria has to run a heavily centralized government where rather than growing the pie for everybody, we actually focus on a small pie which is shrinking, but it's all about sharing. The Nigerian constitution at the moment, which I no longer um, want to call the 1999 constitution, but I want to call it by its proper name, which is uh, Decree 24 of 1998. That doc document mentions the word sharing a total okay. of 52 times. Does not mention productivity once. So what we are running right now is faulty. And until we accept that what we are running is faulty and change it, we are going to keep moving around in circles and achieving nothing. The unfortunate thing is that these circles are actually spiral. So each time we go around the circle, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, back to the starting point, we're actually one level lower. That's what has been happening to us. Okay. Um, 
So I hear you, Cheta. I'd like us to give some historic context, right, to the situation on ground. So I'd like to hear your raw and honest opinion about Biafra. I know it's a controversial topic, but it's a part of our history. And as a people, as Nigerians, we have to embrace our history, um, evaluate the choices, ask questions, understand what really happened so that we can move forward, right? Today, Nigeria has at least 250 ethno-linguistic groups. Right? And some people believe that, okay, some groups have been marginalized. Um, they're calling for a restructuring, in quotes. Personally, I don't think a secession is the answer. But I do know, I recognize that there are issues. There are issues of, you know, biases and divisions along ethnic and religious lines. But that, to an extent, I would say belies the actual issue, which is really that some people, the political class, are, you know, um, the hunger for political supremacy and to control the nation's reserves, etc. So what is your view with what you know about Biafra, um, post-independence, where we are today, and moving forward? What is the best way to proceed from here? First, we need to understand where we're, where we are coming from. We, um, refused as a people to learn our history, understand where we're coming from. And when you don't know where you're coming from, you really cannot know where you're going to. Mm -hmm. So let's start with Biafra. Biafra was a tragedy that could have been avoided. Um, we have uh, the Aburi Conference in January 1967, after the unfortunate events of 1966. The events of 1966 were uh, at the risk of, of uh, sounding dismissive about incidents in which some of my own relations were killed, um, the events of 1966 were essentially a rush of blows to the head. Um, they could have been sorted out if everybody had honored the agreement that was reached in Abu Ghana in 1967. Um, Biafra should never have happened because the war was lost before a shot was fired. Um, the fact is that the moments uh, on the 5th of May 1967, when the federal government created states out of the eastern region, and when the uh, the government of the eastern region failed to secure the support of Cameroon in, uh, in backing its secession, Biafra was over. And this was even before the Republic was declared formally on the 30th of May 1967. So, it, again, it should never have happened. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the fact is the war was fought um, in a very uh, sadistic manner. Um, and despite the fact that at the end of the war we had um, the whole no victor, no vanquish state declared, the, the fact is that the actions of people within the Nigerian government made it clear that they were victors and they were vanquished. Um, among the Igbo people today, one of the things that still rankles was the 20 pound settlement. Um, Nigeria has never apologized for or acknowledged that. Um, having said that, I do geopolitics, that's what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. And I can say point blank that Biafra is dead on arrival. It's not something that will work. The conditions which made the Biafran secession fail in 1967 which is the, uh, the fact that the Igbo ethnic group is stuck in, is basically landlocked and will not get the support it requires from Yaoundé in order to create, uh, to create backward operating bases with, uh, for mobility of its troops still exists. And if those conditions still exist, how do you want to win? Number two, if you look at the geography of Nigeria, you'll find that the, uh, generally speaking, the flattest terrain is in Igbo land. So it's quite difficult to wage a war of attrition from there. Again, the uh, the geography of Igbo lands, uh, the, uh, the entirety of the southeast geopolitical zone is about 29,000 square kilometers. By the time you add uh, Delta, that's uh, the Delta North, the Anioma part of Igbo lands to it, it's about 35,000 square kilometers. Borno State is bigger. Kogi State is bigger. Niger State is bigger. So. What are you really fighting for? Mm -hmm. There's a reason why, um, despite the fact that the Igbo people were defeated in a war, they went back into Nigeria and are found all over Nigeria. Mm -hmm. 
So away from the evil problem, the real problem now is that the financial situation, the fiscal situation of Nigeria is such that given the heavily centralized system that we run, we are all trying or we are all struggling for a cake that is dwindling. Nigeria's budgets, uh, I always um, uh, uh, find it funny when people say, oh, this is the largest budget we've ever had. It's not. The Naira is not a real currency. The Naira is basically a, a window into the, real, into the real currency. When you convert the value of Nigeria's budget at the prevailing dollar rates, you will find that our highest ever budget was 2013, 2014. Mm-hmm. Since then, it's been downhill. So when you tell when you when you tell, say people, tell people that oh oh that we we have more money to spend, we don't have more money to spend, and you can see it. One of the big failures of this government is failing to understand the geopolitical setting in which we live. I'll give an example. Last year, just before the election in Nigeria, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia paid a state visit to India. What was he going? What did he go to do in India? He went to India to bargain for direct sales of Saudi crude oil to India, which is one of the biggest consumers of crude oil in the world mm-hmm. now. Who is Nigeria's biggest uh, 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 market for crude oil? India, after the, of course, after the European Union. Mm-hmm. India, as but the European Union is a block; it's not a single country. So India is our largest market. The Saudis were going to take away our largest market, and we did nothing. nothing we just it. it didn't occur to us. We, we it, it didn't even make news here. In May of last year, the same India actually banned their sailors from coming to the Gulf of Guinea, which is uh, which is Nigeria's domain. Why? Because of rising piracy. For those who don't know, the Gulf of Guinea is now the the, the highest uh, source of sea piracy in the world. India bans their their sailors from coming here. Now, if we cannot sell direct to Indian vessels from here, it means we have to sell to India through third parties. Selling through to India through third parties increases the cost of our oil. Saudi Arabia. The oil producing area of Saudi Arabia is in the east of Saudi Arabia, which is just across the Indian Ocean from India, just one ship away. So it is easier for the Indians to buy oil from Saudi Arabia. Okay, so I might have to cut you there. Sorry, I'm so sorry. We need to go on a quick break. Um, We'll be right back. We still have Cheta and Larry with us.